Hello, Don. Hey, Pete. How are you? This uh, will start our formal session. Um, <laughs> and uh, I want to introduce Don Biverette. And my name is Peter Coat. Don, what, you want to give the initial kind of uh, preview? Yes, indeed. Welcome to Finance and State Literacy. This is It's Your Money, Spring 2022. <laughs> Almost forgot what year it was. Uh, this is week four, the investment world. And what we're going to talk about today is, well, before we get there, hang on. In the investment world. We're going to talk about the investment world. <laughs> and as we do that, it doesn't want to advance. How about that? There you go. First thing is there's a workbook involved. Um, that's a change this session in terms of what we're doing. What we decided was it was important for you to be able to keep notes or collect things or thoughts or something else. Um, it covers the entire six week series. We're now six instead of eight weeks. Um, and it's available the same place you could download all the weekly material. All the workbook is there also. It is strictly for your purposes. We don't collect it. Um, you don't have to turn it in to get a better grade because uh, you're all winners by being here. And so that's the good part. Basically, it's goals and objectives and assumptions on where you are today and where you want to go and where you want to be tomorrow. And that really is the important part of it. The book itself has this as an outline. It's basically we cover the various weeks that are going on. The material is here, downloadable at that site. Pete, do you want to go to the website? Sure. Then hang on just a second. And, let's, uh, let's go there. there. But besides on the website, you can also get articles that we post besides the video and the outline is there. And uh, all of our presenters do what's called an ask first form. And those will be posted on the website as well. Um, financial and estate literacy is a not-for-profit. And our mission is to educate you on money estate and charitable planning. We believe it's good to give, but you can only give once you're secure for yourself. And so the first priority is you, the second priority is your family, and we like to pick charities over taxes. So uh, that's our goal. Uh, you wanna go, what do they do after they go to our website? So if you come into the website, if you click on workshops up in the corner, in this case, we're the It's Your Money series. You can then scroll down. Well, actually, you can now click on the uh, investment world. You can click to the week and jump straight there, uh, which then lets you know here are the Ask First forms for the two presenters, their material, the workbook, and Lindsay had referred to some material on Chapman University. And just as a note, incidentally, let me scroll down here so I can get to it. If I hit previous, there's last week's presentation. So they are all here in the same place, and it's all in that it's your money site and you can go through and get to those. So let me switch back over to my presentation. Too many screens going on here, going in front of me. Okay, let's go back here. So the site to be able to get to that is, um, it's your estate and money. it used to be you had to type out all of this name. We got a much shorter set of initials to it. If you want to do the money session, it's IYM. If you want the estate one, it's IYM. E. So that's yeah, the difference and, between them. But you'll be able to get to our website by just typing in www.iyme.org and you'll get to our page. Yes. Okay. So hang on. Let me do that. Let me move this guy out of the way. So we're now at week four, which is investment. Next week, we will talk about equity and fixed income investing. And then the last one will be bringing all these pieces back together again and letting us go through and see where we are and where we're going. So with that, I'm going to turn the microphone, control, whatever, back to Pete and let him go through. What I will do is monitor the, the uh, Q and A's. I will ask the questions either as we go or I will hold them and keep them as we go along, see how that best works out. But I'm gonna turn it to Pete and Pete's going to introduce our speakers. Yeah, I just wanna say a couple of words about Don. Donna's is our, our philanthropic advisor. What are you going to say, uh, Pete? <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's the drafter of our the workbook. Uh, we couldn't do this program without him. And he's also a CPA. He's also a very nice and kind man, sometimes to me. 
<laughs> anyway, I really appreciate his efforts. Thank, Thank you, you, Don. Thank you. Um, Paul, Michael, why don't you come on board? Hello, Paul. Hello, Hello. Michael. Hey, You're going to be our presenters today. And uh, give us a reality check of what the investment world is like today. Investment uh, world. We, it yeah. sounds like a like a circus. I'm the, the ringleader or something yeah. like that. <laughs> but before we go there, feels like that sometimes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Before we go there, uh, talk a little bit about each one of you. Uh, Michael, you how long have you been in the business? Uh, coming a little over 17 years now. Um, uh, as a RA, a registered investment advisor, I've got my certified financial planning degree. Uh, Paul does as well. Um, and so this is uh, out of college. I went to UCLA out of college, was doing some accounting and then uh, got into uh, the RA business uh, back in 2007. Yeah. And you have a, a special, well, you have a special designation that very few people have. <laughs> And uh, it's called a, a chartered financial analyst. Talk a little bit about that, and 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 what does that mean? Yeah, well, it's CFP. Uh, that's what I've got. The CFP. I, I thought you had, were also a CFA. No, I got to level two on CFP. Oh, then, you got to level two. I've got okay, a ten-year-old and a thirteen-year-old. Uh, <laughs> Oops, <laughs> life gets in the way. But no, CFP. Uh, so I've, I've got. The, the interesting thing, both Paul and I both have our psychology degrees for our undergrad and then CFPs. Yeah. So we and get to blend you work at the same company, correct? We do. Uh, Benefit Financial Services Group. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, Paul, how long have you been in the financial services business? Uh, so I started in the industry in 2004 uh, with Wells Fargo Bank as a financial advisor for them. Um, spent many years kind of in the bank channel. And then um, in 2013, saw the light, left the dark side, uh, came to the light side of the force and joined an RIA in 2013. And then I've uh, been in the RIA side, uh, working with Mike here specifically since 2019. Talk a little bit about uh, how do you charge your clients? So we are fee only. Um, we do that to align our interests with our clients. Uh, we have two services that we provide. We offer investment management and financial planning. So a client that comes for us to help them manage their investments, we charge a fee for that. Um, and it's a flat fee each year the client pays. And we just do that, again, to remove conflicts of interest, align our interests with the clients. And what is that fee? Uh, the fee ranges around 1%. Depends on the amount invested with us, but typically around 1% on average. Okay. And so and for the financial planning services, is that extra? No. Uh, we like simplicity. Um, life is complex enough. So that 1% fee includes the financial planning services that we offer. Okay. We, do, do you offer but, any kind of a free look or um, how do, how does a client become know about you or become comfortable with you? Yeah, typically we'll have a, a two meetings um, with a new prospect. First one, just getting to know each other. See if we're a good fit, because it's like anything else in life. It comes down to relationship and philosophy. If you have a good relationship, you can trust the advisor. What they're saying makes sense and matches with what you, how you want to do things. Could be a good fit. Then we have a second meeting looking more into the financial picture. We'll, we'll provide a free assessment on their investments, general financial advice for them where we can um, just to help them out. And then okay. from there, they can decide whether to work with us or not. That's and how much do you everyone. have? It's, Michael, it's, how much do you have under management? We have uh, we have two sides of the business: the institutional side that does retirement plan consulting for hospitals, cities, and so on, and corporations, and they consult on uh, a little over sixteen billion. And then our wealth management division that Paul and I uh, sit on and, and um, work with individuals, uh, we uh, manage over a billion dollars, a little over a billion. Okay, it's not a small amount. <laughs> no, no, we're <clears throat> big enough, but at the same time, not not so large. Where again, I, I think, like Paul said, I mean, we really try to help everyone and anyone. And um, we're, what we're do you saying. average per client? I mean, per advisor, <clears throat> each advisor has how many clients approximately? 
I know you do it as a group, but yeah. Yeah. We all work as a team. Um, and Paul and I are pretty much or other CFPs are on a call with one client. You get two people pretty much on every, every call, but I'd say each of us are what Paul, like a hundred clients, hundred 75 to 100. 75, yeah, to 100. Yeah. But and the reason why I'm asking that is, is that we're going to talk a little bit about the investment world. And so uh, what, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about, and I want you guys to go into what does the typical broker have as the yeah. number of clients? So we'll get into that. <clears throat> what we're going to be doing uh, in this particular session is as they bring up their presentation, is, is that I am asking them to, first of all, their presentation can be downloaded from our website. So you can read the whole presentation uh, on your own if you like. Um, I'm asking them to put the presentation on the screen and as we're talking for them to come back on the screen so that we'll can see their faces and we can have a dialogue. Uh, we're trying to make it more like an in-person session, but we'll see where it goes. So uh, thank you guys for being here. And why don't you guys go ahead and start? There we go. Okay, so I think like Pete said, the, we're trying to separate the big difference between what a registered investment advisor is and a broker. Um, and this, there's a lot of text on the screen, but if we focus on the left in the bold words and underline uh, on the left, a fee only registered investment advisor uh, has to act as a fiduciary. That's a, a legal standard. And what is a fiduciary? It's someone who's going to put your best interest first, always. Uh, they're not trading for their own account ahead of you. They're not selling you something. Uh, because it makes them a big commission. Um, they have to do what's right in, in, for you at all times. Um, some RAs are not fee only. Um, that's, I think, another big difference is you want to find the fee only. Um, actually, only 20% of SEC or Securities and Exchange Commission registered advisors are fee only. Um, and only 8% of RA clients are receiving financial planning services. Um, so we're proud that we, we are both, again, fee only and uh, provide comprehensive uh, services, investment and financial planning. So your firm <clears throat> is not the typical firm. No, I, I, I mean, we've been doing this for a long time. Uh, the firm's been in existence since the early 90s. Um, and you are seeing more and more like uh, Paul said, come from from the broker side to the RA side. But this is kind of our bread and butter, we've been, uh, it's, it's in our blood. We've been doing this for a long time. So when you talk about a registered representative who is a broker, um, typically uh, are they, how do they charge? Yeah, so, I mean, there's a, a lot of different models on that side, um, but oftentimes it's commission-based. Um, you're seeing them, sell something and, and what's bolded there is a, it's more of a transactional relationship. They don't operate under a fiduciary standard. It's something called the best interest standard where they must, and this just changed recently, um, where they must act in your best interest at the time of the recommendation, um, but not in the overall relationship. So it's more of a transactional than ongoing. We're always acting in your best interest or another RA is. Um, I find it totally confusing. It, it is. The, it, it is the, just. <laughs> it's it, totally <laughs> confusing. And, and the, there was so much lobbying done by the broker side. They made it confusing. Um, it's, it's not very clear. Um, but they do typically sell more products commission that are commission-based mutual funds uh, with commissions, annuities, and so on, which we'll get into later on in the presentation. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So I think a couple key things that we want to make sure everyone's aware of when you are searching for a financial advisor is not all financial advisors are created equal. 
but there's some important considerations. I, I think Paul touched on, our, on it already is relationship. We have two meetings because one is just all about relationship building. If you don't have a good relationship, it's kind of like dating. <laughs> you want to have a good relationship with your advisor. Uh, and that's that's key to kicking off uh, uh, the relationship on, on the right foot and, and making sure you your interests are aligned. But there are other things to look for. I mentioned that fiduciary um, and being held to uh, a higher standard, fee only. Yeah, I always ask the question, are you paid by, are you receiving monies from any other source except from me? You know, so uh, follow the money. So, because if they're getting money from other sources, they've got other bosses that they have to please. So you essentially have only one boss and that's your client. Is that correct? That's exactly correct. That's the perfect way to phrase it. Um, proper education, uh, Paul and I both hold uh, our CFPs. Um, we also have a couple CPAs on staff. We've got multiple CFAs. These are all different designations, but they're most widely recognized that either specialize in financial planning, taxes, or investments. Um, we all work as a team and leverage each other. Uh, Paul, he's definitely got more of a background in insurance. So when we're analyzing insurance, that helps out. Uh, and so I leverage him when I see an annuity or something. Paul, dig into this. Tell me what, what, where's the hidden fees in this? Um, Paul, how did you get your insurance uh, 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 background? Uh, so that's actually where I started. I got my insurance license first and then through that met an advisor uh, with Wells Fargo who became a mentor and kind of got me into the industry. So um, I started on the insurance side of the house for the first like six years doing that and investments as well. But um, I also worked at USAA for a while, um, which is an insurance company. Um, so I learned a whole lot there that I wouldn't have learned anywhere else, just kind of being in the belly of the beast, so to speak. Yeah. And it, since you're from the insurance area, insurance is important, yes. but is it, uh, does it encompass your entire financial life? It shouldn't. It's, it's a piece of the, it's a, it's a puzzle piece, right? You got to put all the pieces together. It's a very important cornerstone piece to someone's plan, but it's not the be all end all. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, uh, insurance should be bought but it's sold more uh and uh, so it's we'll cover insurance today um it is an important piece of that risk management piece of the financial plan um but it's sold more often than yeah it, than in fact here in california by law i cannot hire an individual on an hourly basis to help me with an insurance policy unless they're licensed in the state of California and I, they can only be paid through commissions. Yep. <laughs> yeah. it, it's, it, it's unbelievable. Uh, yeah. I just don't understand that, uh, but that's how strong the insurance industry is. And there's no national regulation on the insurance industry. The insurance no, not. industry just got annuities into 401k plans as well. They yes. very strong lobbying. Yes. Yes. And that's the investment world today. Let's go to the next slide. Yep. So uh, interesting that you mentioned insurance is not, um, you know, it's done at the state level. It's not done at the federal level. Whereas us on the investment side, uh, we are uh, held to, uh, we report to the SEC, the Security and Exchange Commission. Um, that's the U.S. government agency that regulates security transactions, activities of professionals, mutual fund trading, all that to try and mitigate uh, fraud, manipulation, and deception in the markets. Uh, aside from that, there's also what is called FINRA, which is the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority. And this is a self-regulated regulatory organization. So members of the New York Stock Exchange come together and this is uh, them trying to provide some sort of oversight so that the profession doesn't get too much in trouble with the SEC. Um, so FINRA is important, but the one that really is 
um, the end all be all is the SEC, because that is the government agency that has, that is the ultimate regulator of securities. Uh, and they oversee FINRA as well. So, yeah. And you could Google FINRA called uh, and go to broker check and you can identify any individual. And on your business cards, do you have a lot of small little, uh, the, the, the fine print on your business cards, Michael and Paul? Nope. Nope. No, we don't, no. <laughs> That's what you want. <clears throat> when somebody shows you, if to somebody is a member of FINRA and they have a lot of small type print on their business card, it means they're a broker and they have to identify themselves as such. And here are some of those licenses. Let's go just go through a few of them. Uh, but most people think that a license is a credential. What is a license and what do you have to do to get them? A license is a test that you have to pass. Um, the Series 7 typically takes about three months, four months. And then the 65 is the other. So most brokers have their 7 and their 65. The 7 takes about three to four months to get. This is learning about how to sell all investment products like stocks and bonds, um, options, things like that, that are not commodities or futures. And, 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 and the key word is how to sell. Correct. Yeah. Correct. And then the 66 uh, is a combination of the 65 and the 63. So um, and this is just understanding the state laws with the 63. And the 65 is a lot of legalese. And this, uh, most people will study and pass this within a month. So to get your seven and your 66, which is a combination of 65 and 63, typically takes about four or five months. Yeah, and you have no minimum educational requirement. You don't have to be a college graduate. You can manage a billion dollars and not be, and, and be licensed in, uh, in the United States to uh, sell investments. Yeah, Paul, why don't you cover, I mean, just with our background, CFP, what that kind of entails, just to show the difference. Sure. Um, so an actual um, designation, like a CFP or the CFA or CPA, those are going to take months to study for, typically anywhere from like the CFA program takes on average about four years to get that designation. The CFP on average takes about 10 to 12 months to get that designation. Uh, where you're sitting for an exam, um, you're agreeing to be held to a higher standard because now that designation that you have, you report to them, they have their ethics as well. So someone that has their CFP or CFA, that means in, in theory, they're more knowledgeable, but doesn't guarantee that they're still not doing silly things. Yeah. Yeah, but it is something to look for. It's a good and, starting point. And you have continuing education every year. You have to meet a, a Oh, yes. Standard. We like our continuing education, 30 yeah. hours a year. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I always picture a, a financial. By the way, is there a rule of law that says you can call yourself one thing or another? Uh, in other words, is there something that says you're a financial planner versus a wealth consultant or... Uh, uh, or I can make you rich, or not? Not really. Yeah. Uh, you can call can yourself use, anything you want. Any title. I mean, the CFP, the CFA, the CPA. I mean, there are marks and trademarks and how you have to use it. Um, so, I mean, to be a certified financial planner, that is uh, trademarked by the CFP, and you can't use that in other ways. But you can call yourself a financial planner as long as uh, you're not using it wrong. I, yeah. I find a broker in the financial services industry very similar to a real estate agent. Not to disparage real estate agents, uh, but there isn't a high hurdle to get into the, uh, the profession. And this is the same in the brokerage industry. When you started working for Wells Fargo, Paul, uh, yeah. Uh, and let's say you recommended an annuity or recommended a particular product. Um, how did how how did you get paid? Uh, it was commissions. I I ate what I killed, simply put. So of course, uh, in in those areas, there is a push to sell insurance because that is a high profit area for the bank and for the advisor. 
So they do a lot of annuity, a lot of insurance policies. What broke my straw, like the final thing that got me out of the bank channel and into the RIA space was I was working brand new at uh, JP Morgan Chase, number two in all of Southern California for bringing in new business. Uh, so doing very well, but helping the clients. I got called out on a national sales call because there was no uh, annuity sales that I've done. So me and a handful of other advisors by our boss's boss in front of all our peers got called out for not selling an annuity for the year. Yeah. And, and so, just like, um, uh, let's say uh, an insurer, uh, excuse me, a real estate agent, uh, let's say they have a free percent commission. Well, that free percent commission doesn't go to them. They have to share it with their broker. So when you sell a, a product, when you first started out, how much did you have to share with Wells Fargo? Uh, typically for most wire houses, the payouts are around 30 to 40%. So okay. the broker keeps about 35 to 40% of whatever the revenue is from the product. Yeah. So understand how it works. And when somebody changes brokers, they go from Wells Fargo to UBS, or are they doing it because they want to serve their clients better? <laughs> Or what's the story on that brokerage change? It's all this time. It's the greenback. Okay. Because yeah. that broker is now offering more to the individual as far as keeping part of that commission. Yeah. Well, the higher bank payouts, correct. Typically making more, so making 35%, maybe they can make 55% somewhere else. So they're going to go because that's going to be in their best interest. Yeah, they get paid for their book of business to bring it from Merrill Lynch to Wells Fargo. And okay. then, like Paul's saying, they're maybe collecting a little more of the dollar. And so when they whether they sell something to their, their client, they're keeping more of it. Yeah. So, okay, let's go to the next slide. All right. So uh, let's talk a little bit about insurance. When we uh, look at Paul, life... Not... Sharon, oh. sorry. Thank you. Let's do that. There we go. All right. So when we talk about insurance, uh, specifically life insurance, there's two types. There are what are called term policies. Those typically last somewhere between 10 to 30 years. The premium is guaranteed. And the nice thing about the term is it's going to be the most uh, inexpensive. It's the cheapest form. It's, and it works just like your auto insurance, right? God forbid you have a premature death, the life insurance policy pays out. If you don't, well, you paid for something you never use, but it didn't cost a lot to begin with. So that tends to be the best way to go. Um, the other form of insurance are what are called permanent life insurance policies. These are policies that build a cash value over time, and they're designed to last the rest of your life. Um, these policies could be what's called a whole life, a variable, or a universal policy. Uh, these policies, um, essentially how they work is you're paying more premiums upfront because the older you get, the more expensive life insurance becomes, right? The, the greater risk of death as you get older. So the idea with the cash value policies is you try and have the same premiums over your lifetime, but more of that premium in the front is building a cash value but that cash value is growing and that cash value is there to offset those future premium increases. Unfortunately, a lot of advisors will look at this cash value and they'll try and sell it as an investment. And life insurance is great for protection. And there are some great times to use permanent life insurance. I can give you several where we've helped clients with that. Um, but insurance should never be an investment. It should be insurance. I think that's just a really important distinction to make there. Unfortunately, um, there are people that are just life insurance licensed that will sell it as an investment. And a lot of those people actually got kicked out of the uh, stock industry. So got to yeah. be careful there. Be yeah. careful. Understand if somebody has an insurance license, you're more than likely going to get an insurance product recommendation. Yeah, uh, you're better off working with, with a fee-only financial planner because they're not going to make any money on the commissions. So if they recommend life insurance, there's a probably a strong possibility that you have a need for the life insurance. 
And oftentimes they're gonna lean more towards the term product over that permanent product. There are times where you may have a combination of both. So right. just depends what the need is uh, for the individual, but 90% of the time or greater term is more than sufficient. And one of the what? nice things with term also is there's a lot of term policies have a provision to convert to a whole life policy without right. evidence of insurability. So it's, it's, you kind of, I mean, you get more, a less expensive policy, and then you've got the conversion uh, ability there as well. Let's go to the next slide. So before, <clears throat> before we get into the annuity, um, give me a, a little bit of an overview of, of the investment world as to other products, because we're going to talk about the two primary ones, annuities, mutual funds are the two major ones. But what are some of the other products that are being sold today uh, by brokers? We'll cover that more in depth for sure, Peter. But okay. just to kind of do high level, there are other assets that are um, more complex in nature, whether it's like a real estate investment trust, limited partnerships, venture capital, private placements, um, doing things like uh, commercial loans um, or what's called mezzanine financing. So there's a lot of other potential avenues for investing. The mortgage-backed securities, that was correct. a product that was sold extensively. Yeah, the, yeah. It was. Bad. That's what led to the 08 crisis, and that's what the big short was all about. Yeah. It was a great movie. Don, you have a question. So I want to stay with insurance. So a question was asked. So overall, then, do you recommend buying term? Uh, for most individuals, yes. Uh, typically, where we use a permanent policy is going to be where there's a need for insurance for the rest of a life. So, for example, if you're doing estate planning, Life insurance could be very valuable as leaving an asset to kids, uh, money for a charity, uh, whatever the case is. But there we use what's called like a second to die policy, which is not a cash value policy. Thank Typically you. where we do the cash value is going to be someone that has, um, you know, maybe a special needs child that we need to make sure that there's a policy there for the rest of their life. And so we want to make sure there's money for the kid. Um, a permanent policy would be an excellent way to help find certain things like that. Yeah, so the answer from a legal standpoint is, it depends. It depends. It depends <laughs> On the and, and, and absolutely, that's the answer because it, yeah. what is the situation the person is in? Correct. And so that's, yeah, thank you. Okay, let's go back to the, uh, we're gonna focus now for a little bit on annuities. And uh, this is a multi, multi-billion dollar business. Uh, and so uh, uh, they're sold by everybody. Uh, but mainly insurance companies provide or have the policies. So talk a little bit about each one. And uh, by the way, when I say there are circumstances where an annuity works out for you, but Absolutely. for most times, uh, they're not the most recommended product. Yeah, Typically, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, typically annuities are something we kind of fall into. It's not something you lead with. Yeah, it's kind of just like the the insurance slide we were just looking at. I mean, annuity is a type of insurance, um, uh, but it's just like permanent term. Typically, it, again, depends on the situation, but most of the time we're looking at term, um, not permanent. Um, same with annuities. We're not typically looking at annuities, um, but they make sense for some people. Um, the three most common types uh, of deferred annuities are fixed, variable, and indexed. Um, you don't see too many fixed just because uh, of the interest rate environment we've been in. Uh, new contracts typically guaranteed a rate of return of around 1% today, maybe a little more uh, now that interest rates have gone up a little, but you don't see too many fixed. What you get, you see a lot of are variable annuities and indexed annuities, um, those are often sold. Um, as Paul was mentioning, insurance shouldn't be looked at as an investment, more as a risk management tool. And you see variables, annuities, they are, I mean, investments. You carry investment risk uh, and you have the potential to make or lose money on a variable. If you're 
money is invested in stocks and bonds. Uh, so you do have the ability to earn more, but unfortunately the fees of annuities are pretty high uh, and the underlying investments also have higher expense ratios. Index annuities are definitely at the last couple of years um, being sold much more uh, common uh, and they say they're, they're, there's no fees on them, but when you dig underneath and you look at the, the contract, there's definitely fees or the way they're getting paid out. We're going to cover more about index annuities. Um, what an index annuity is, is, is just linked to a common stock market index. Um, and then there's some type of typically principal protection. Um, you get capped on the upside and you limit your downside. Yeah. These are the ones, <clears throat> the index annuity are the ones that's, that, that are sold when you get the free lunch and the free dinners. Yeah. yeah. These, they, they, they have an, they have commissions on these suckers that are from eight to 20%. Your average uh, Merrill Lynch and UBS won't even sell these index annuities because the commissions are so high. They don't even think it's appropriate for a particular client. I, you know, but uh, be careful. They make these things sound really, really good. You yeah. can't lose your money. We will take your losses. Be very careful. Yeah. Yes, Don. Is a defined benefit pension, which is sometimes referred to as an, another, an annuity, is that a fourth kind of annuity? You can annuitize a defined benefit where you're getting a payout, um, just like these annuities, but it's, it's different. Um, Paul, you want to add anything? Yeah. So remember, the definition of annuity is a paycheck for life, right? It's a lump sum of money that's turned into an income stream for the rest of your life. So by definition, uh, defined benefits or pensions are technically a type of annuity, but those are done with your employer or your union. Those are completely different than what we're talking about here. And there are annuities out there called SPIAs, single premium immediate annuities. That's where you literally give like a lump sum, like $500,000 to an insurance company. And they turn that into a paycheck for the rest of your life. That is what an annuity was designed to be, is an income stream for the rest of your life. Um, what we're talking about here are now those sort of products that are now being turned into investments. Yeah, and, I, and, and as a philanthropic advisor to financial and state literacy, <laughs> I'm going to add, there's also a charitable gift annuity, which Lindsay from Chapman would love to talk about. And that is a very different world than Correct. what we're talking about here. So if, you, if you're with us uh, next week on It's Your Estate, you'll find out what a charitable gift annuity is, and they're very different than commercial annuities. Yeah, Thank you, see, you, know, you know, your definition of uh, an annuity, Paul, is also could be applicable to Social Security. Yeah. Sure. Pay, yeah. Pay check for the rest of your life. Yeah. The, the investment world likes to confuse things and put the annuity in the name so that way they can sell them. It's like, oh yeah, you're getting a guaranteed income stream, but they turn it into investment or make commissions. So yeah, and and people are people generally secure about their money. Once they got a financial plan in place, they are more <laughs> secure. But no, typically no. <laughs> but generally, uh, not too many people feel like they have enough or yeah. can. Or, or they're because you because you're saving your entire life, and now all well, of a sudden you don't get a paycheck, and you got to depend on it. And so when somebody says guaranteed and income for life, I mean those are very appealing to the emotional yeah. side of of me, anyway. Yeah, for sure. That's how they get you, yeah. Guaranteed and no downside risk and all the upside. But yeah. there's there's no there's no uh, free lunch in, in life. I, I think we've all learned that. There's somehow they're getting paid. Yeah. yeah. So so let's. Uh, where do you want to go next? All right. So one of the downsides to annuities are the surrender fees. Mike, can I talk a little bit more on that? Yeah. I mean, we're going to cover the underlying fees and the surrender fees, but I, I think. One of the problems with annuities is often they get sold to, to retirees and you're getting your money locked up for up to 15 years. We've seen policies um, and you can only pull 10% of your 
your money out each year, anything above that for those first, however long the contract is, um, you pay something called a surrender fee. Um, and that typically goes down the longer you hold it. But you can see in this example, the first year, if you go, oops, I need some of my money back. You, you have some health issue, hospital bills to pay. Uh, you're going to pay an 8% surrender penalty. Um, and that's, that's typical. We've seen as high as 15%. Um, but most annuities allow you to pull 10% without penalty. But anything above that, um, you're going to pay a, a, an additional penalty on. Um, so, so they're not so, liquid in investments. Michael, so the question would be <laughs> is, is that when you get into an investment, you should ask, what if I want my money back? What is it going to cost me? Yep. And you should know that up front. Exactly. So because it's not just annuities that maybe have that problem. Sometimes uh, uh, CDs, uh, partnerships, real estate. Uh, you know, there's lots of investments out there that if you withdraw early, you're going to get penalized or they might not be yep. a market for it uh, for you to get your money back. Yeah, typically. Yeah, the... and that's a good point, Peter, because every investment under the sun has some form of risk. Cash is guaranteed, but you have the risk of it not keeping up the rate of inflation. With, an, with annuities, one of the risks we have here is liquidity. You know, your money is tied up and there's a cost to it if you want to get access to that money. So that is a risk you take when you're investing these sort of contracts. Yeah. And it's t t completely tax inefficient. Oh, yeah. absolutely. We'll touch absolutely. on that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't, Paul, I don't think we have a slide on the tax. The, the, yeah. But it just, it comes out the worst dollars tax wise come out first. So it's just a, an awful, all of it is ordinary income and yeah. uh, there's no capital gains tax and you're, you're locked in for however, because you as a financial advisor sometimes have to sit there, wait, let's, we got to wait out the term of the contract because it doesn't pay for you to get out of it. Yeah. Yeah. We have a lot of clients still come to us after they've done annuity and they may be in here like three or four. And like Peter said, we just sit and have to wait until year eight, like in this example here, because we're never going to recommend that a client lose money. So you got to kind of just wait it out and then you might be able to find some better alternatives. So yeah. always want to know the surrender <clears throat> charge if you're going to get into an annuity. Are there contracts out there that do not have a surrender charge? There are actually. Um, they're newer and they're offered by RIAs uh, who are fiduciaries typically. Okay. But they're, yeah, they work similar to a normal investment, but they just charge a percentage, like the, you know, whatever the cost is each year, typically three quarters of a percent to one and a quarter percent. And then the client just pays that fee each year. And those do not actually have a surrender penalty. Let's go to the next slide. So looking at variable annuities. So we talked about the surrender penalty and that's the, costs you have to pay if you want to break the contract early. With variable annuities, uh, variable annuities, they take your money and your money is invested in mutual funds. And we'll talk more about mutual funds in just a second. But with a variable annuity, you carry the investment risk. So if the, annuity, if the mutual fund does well, you make more money. If the mutual funds do bad, you lose money. And so that can hurt your investment over time. On top of that, variable annuities are very expensive. They typically will have um, four different fees attached to them. The first one is what's called M&E, the mortality and expense ratio. This is just the cost of running the annuity. This is what it costs the insurance company for that. And then they will typically on top of that have another administration fee, which is up to a quarter percent then you will have um, the mutual funds will have uh, investment expenses. It's called the fund expense ratio. That fee typically is around 1% on average. And then you may have what's called the living benefit writer. Most of these annuities are sold with the idea of this guaranteed paycheck for the rest of your life. And so they will provide some guarantees to increase the chance of income that you're gonna get for the rest of your life. But like anything, you have to pay for that that cost is typically around 1%. So when you add up all these fees, 
the typical annuity is going to have anywhere from about two and a half to three and a half percent in fees each year. That makes a one percent being charged by your investment advisor real cheap. Yeah, and the other thing too, Paul, is is that these mm -hmm. fees are are stated in the contract, but you know, um, Worth Magazine, well, yeah, that Worth thick? Magazine once that said thick? that that there's 12 attorneys in the United States that do not work for an insurance company that I can understand a variable annuity contract. They are almost impossible to read and understand. Yeah, I mean, by law, when you sign up for one of these variable annuities, you have a 30-day grace period. You can decide 28 days after you sign the paperwork that you don't want to do this and you can walk away no harm, no foul. It is the only investment that has a 30-day grace period because of that complexity. It's the, well, the only other one that um, is uh, timeshares, but they have a three to four day. So it gives you yeah. an idea that insurance has 30, <laughs> how much okay. complicated it is. Yeah, so that's the fee structure for variable annuities. Index annuities, their fee structure is different. With a index annuity, they're going to tell you that there's no fee. So you're not going to be paying that three and a half percent or whatever that we just saw on the previous slide with a variable. But with an index, they work differently. Instead, your returns are linked to a stock market index, most commonly the S&P 500. And your returns are going to mirror whatever that index does up to a point. Most of them have what's called a cap. So they'll say for the year, you can't make more than 6%. So if the S&P does 30% for the year, they pocket that 24% and then you get to keep the 6%. So insurance companies love these index products because they're very easy to sell because there's no fees, but then that spread, the difference between what the investments actually do and what they're giving you is typically very large. And so they are paid very nicely to, to offer these products. This is an example of a real client that we had on their return on their index annuity for 2020, okay? This one has what's called a monthly cap of 1%. So theoretically, the annuity, they can make 12% per year. They can make that 1% each year. But in January, the index did 3.28, they're capped at 1%. The loss for the month of February was 1.3. Well, they tell you that you can't lose money in these indexes that's capped at 0%. Well, in this case, they cap you on the upside at 1%, but the losses are uncapped. So they charge you the full loss, but they only give you 1% on the upside. So month two, we have a loss of 1.3. Month seven and eight, July and August, we have a loss of around 10%. When you add all these up, it equals negative 16%. So they show negative 16%. Oh, we're just going to charge you zero. So you just didn't make any money this year. But the good news is you didn't lose any money because it would have been 16% negative. What the S&P actually did that year was 15.75%. And by the so, way, you have to be a math genius <laughs> you do. To, to do this kind of calculation. <clears throat> but so, you know, <clears throat> don't try to figure this out but it's just sounds too good to be true. And this is just sounds, one thing. I mean, the yeah. cap, there's participation rates, how much you participate. The fees of the indexes are typically higher that you're tracking. Um, yeah. They don't pay, typically it's only on, on re uh, return. They don't, they exclude dividends from the index, which are a big portion of historical returns. So there's all different ways that they- But you get a free dinner. And you a get glass a free of dinner. wine. You get a free dinner. You get something sold with no fees. But yeah, there's, just, there's definitely ways. Just say no. Just say no. Don't attend these programs. Let's go to the next slide. All right. So let's talk a minute for mutual funds. All right. Uh, these are one of the most common uh, ways to invest out there. They've been around since 1940. Is it 40 or 41? Um, but yeah, they've been around for over 80 years at this point. They're a proven commodity. Um, and the whole idea with the mutual fund is 
for a lot of people, it's hard to have a properly diversified portfolio and just buy stocks. Realistically, you should have about 30 different stocks if you want to have a, a well-diversified portfolio. Um, and to do that does take a lot of money. So instead, what a mutual fund does is it takes your money and it pulls it with other investors that are, have the same goal. So maybe you guys all want to invest in the S&P 500, which is the 500 largest companies here in the US. Well, then what happens is you're going to have a fund manager that's going to take that pool of money and choose the investments. And then the investment returns are going to be generated. There's going to be a fee. Um, the average fee is around 0.75 to 1% that the mutual fund company keeps for running the mutual fund. And then the rest of the returns go back to the investors each year. So this is one of the most common ways to, investment, to invest. Um, they've been around a long time. They're proven. They do well. This is what's in virtually everyone's 401ks. Most people are, the vast majority of people are going to be invested in mutual funds. How, how many mutual funds are there in the uh, in the industry? Uh, Over 10,000? 10, 10,000 plus. Yeah, I was going to say that. Yeah. Easy. Easy. <laughs> 20, it's, so it's close to 20 to 30,000. Yeah, it's it's a ton. Yeah. Um, I think the key is, Paul mentioned, it, each of these have an expense ratio. Um, you want to find funds uh, that keep their, their fees low. Um, and, and Paul's going to touch on expenses here. Yeah. Um, we can have one mutual fund, take the T row price, uh, S and P 500 growth. I think that one has 10 different versions of the mutual fund and all 10 versions. The only difference is on how the fees are charged. Um, the most common ones that are sold by brokers are going to be a class A, B, or C. If you hear A, B, or C on mutual funds, just run. Not good for you. Simply put, an A share, um, you pay all the fee up front, typically around 5.75. And then it's going to have an annual uh, fee of about 1%. So if you invest 100,000, they charge you that 5,750. You, you give them 100,000 and they start your account at 94,250. You've lost money on the first day. Yeah, yeah. you're already in the hole. <laughs> yeah. Um, class B is a type A fund, sorry, type C fund that turns into a type A fund. It is the worst, the worst. In fact, it's, it's illegal at virtually every broker dealer to sell these because they're so bad. By the way, if you look at your statement that you receive from monthly from your broker, right next to the mutual fund, they'll have class A, class B, class C, class F, class D. It might be incumbent upon yourself to look that, uh, use the internet, Google that share and see what that class means, that uh, alphabet soup that you have after the name. Because one of the things that you want to do is the check mark where it says green. What does that mean? You want to look for mutual funds with no lows. So no upfront sales costs. Uh, this was championed by Vanguard. And you can find this at any, any place now has no load funds, whether it's Charles Schwab, Fidelity, BlackRock, Vanguard, they all have no load funds at this point. But those are mutual funds that you can buy and there's no sales commission. So, so it, the financial world is a little bit different than the rest of the world in the sense that the lower the cost, the better it is for you. Yeah. I mean, the more money in your pocket, that's the best. I wish I had a crystal ball to tell you what future returns are going to be, but if you keep fees low, uh, the, the likelihood of you making money and, and higher but, but returns. That, but it's, it's totally because. different in, you know, when I go out and buy a product, uh, another product, if I pay a little bit more for it, I expect greater quality. Sure. But in the financial world, that's just not the case. No. <laughs> Nope. It, it's it's a real oxymoron to get, try to get your head around it that the uh, that the less expensive that you are have to pay, the better off you're going to be in the long run. Yep. Yeah. And unfortunately, with all these products that are sold, uh, and when there's polls done by like Gallup and so on, um, politicians rank really low. 
um, in trust and, and in the industry. Unfortunately, financial services are not too far behind uh, politicians. That's, that's just horrible for the industry. Um, and that's because of some of these products that are just sold um, from mutual funds to annuities to insurance. Um, and it's, it's just, they make it confusing. Oh, it's when you, you know, I have a son and when he was like, even today, I think if you give somebody more than three to five choices, you become confused. Yep. Yeah. You can't psychologically deal with a 10,000 different options. Yeah. There's a, I just pulled it off my bookshelf. There's a great book called Nudge uh, that's talking all about that is choices and limiting choices. And you can nudge people to do the right thing uh, instead of confusing them. So, yeah. Pull, and it's easy book. to confuse somebody. Don, speaking <clears throat> of confusion. <laughs> Thanks. Um, names of good low cost mutual funds that don't throw off a lot of capital gains and tax effect. I yeah. like my job, so I can't name explicit funds. <laughs> um, but there are plenty of fund companies out there um, that are very reputable. Like I said, Charles Schwab, Vanguard, BlackRock. Start with those big names, do your research, and kind of go from there. Yeah, Sorry, okay. I, we just, just no, no, no. by law, I can't give specific recommendations. What I would, I do want to point out, we didn't really talk about it. And I know Mark Wilson will be talking about it probably in the next series. Um, but ETFs, exchange traded funds, um, are a type of mutual fund in a sense, but it's just traded daily instead of at the end of the day, like a mutual fund. The structure, and I'm not going to get into detail, but how they build those um, are more tax efficient and they are typically cheaper because they're passive and just tracking an index. Um, so there's, like Paul was saying- I Are mean, you guys gonna talk about uh, what is an index fund? We, we can talk about it, we didn't have a slide for it. Um, okay, I, yeah. <clears throat> well, let's go through the mutual fund slides and then at the end, we can talk about the index funds. Well, uh, that, now's the perfect time because we'll transition okay. to another investment uh, in just a second. Okay. Yeah. So uh, index funds, versus active funds, there's there's active mutual funds and passive mutual funds, or what's also called index funds. An index fund or a passive fund is just trying to mimic an index. So if Paul mentioned the S&P 500, the 500 largest US companies. And all that is, is you're investing in a fund, it's trying to replicate that same return that you're gonna get in the index. You're always gonna do a little worse because the fund has an under, underlying expense ratio. Um, but you're just trying to track what the market gives you. An active fund is a manager trying to select stocks and or bonds and choose the ones they, they think are going to do the best and avoid the losers. Um, and so you pay a little more for that active management. And the, the goal is to try to do better on the upside and do uh, better on the downside. That's what the goal of active is. Uh, you pay higher fees for that, though, typically. Warren Buffett <clears throat> said, if you're, you're if you're a consumer and you're doing it yourself, stay with index funds. They're tax efficient and they're cheap. And uh, uh, it's the best thing for you. Yeah, that's and, and that's. Yeah, don't try to 90. There's studies that show 90 percent of your historical re, your returns are by having the proper asset allocation, the right mix of stocks and bonds and the underlying asset classes. If you have real estate, US stocks, international stocks, that drives 90 plus percent of your returns. Um, the other thing is keep fees low. Finding the, the next hot stock or whatever, that's not driving your returns, your long-term yeah. returns. We'll go through some of those in a little bit. I saw the rest of your slides. So uh, yeah. we'll go through some. Uh, do you wanna go to the next slide? So we get to the uh, fun topic of uh, the moment, ah, uh, <laughs> cryptocurrencies. Are, we could spend the next hour on recommendations on Bitcoins. <laughs> yeah, and I'm no, I'm no expert here. Uh, we know enough to be dangerous, uh, but um, it's uh, definitely the Wild West. Uh, I think the SEC commissioner actually uh, said that uh, cryptocurrencies are the Wild West. Bitcoin is one type of cryptocurrency. It's, it's kind of first mover advantage. Uh, there are 
10,000 plus other cryptocurrencies out there. You, you know, um, it reminds me of uh, it, about 100 years ago, there was um, uh, tulips, tulip bulbs. Yep. They were the hottest thing going. Tulip bulbs. They were selling at the time like $125 for one tulip bulb. And now looking back on it, you go, well, that was crazy. Uh, um, when I was working with the um, uh, um, FPA, we had a stretch period where um, uh, rabbit farms there uh, were, were the new hot partnerships <laughs> <laughs> because everybody needed a rabbit pelt coat that they were going to wear and shoes and and amazing it took just it just took off uh i love this slide yeah it's definitely i mean you see the the returns that oh, have the tulip been. you got the tulip bulb on there we yeah. got yeah. on this one yeah this is the next slide so just, like, oh, i'm I sorry to i this. took that yeah away from it's all ball. right no no it's no right. but you, there's always some speculative bubble uh, that has happened over time. You, Pete, you're, you're right on with the tulip mania, um, but you've seen that from there to the railways to uh, the tech bubble, you, you name it. We think today it is the, the FOMO movement or the fear of missing out. Yeah, um, I, and, you know, and the, that, you, you talk about the tech bubble in the 90s since I was right in my 50s about that time people were mortgaging their properties to get it into yep. the dot-com stocks. Yeah. Pets.com. You, you know, anything with a dot-com at the ah, end of it was hot. It, new yes. theory on investments. Those were the headlines. The old days are gone. Yeah. It's always, <laughs> uh, this time is different. Um, but, uh, I think Mark Twain said it, um, History doesn't repeat, but it often rhymes. Um, and so we're very cautious in following hot tips and we believe in sticking to a long-term consistent investment plan um, is key. Um, so with these cryptocurrencies and other uh, Go back stocks, to your previous slide. Yeah. So cryptocurrencies, um, I mean, there's all reasons for why someone can invest in it. Uh, they've argued for, hey, this is a store of value. One, I mean, we don't believe that. That gets a big X next to it because uh, Bitcoin volatility is just off the charts. It moves around so much. Um, you know, if if you were going to go pay for a, a Starbucks coffee and you go to pay with Bitcoin and all of a sudden you've got $10 worth of Bitcoin and then it, you go to, it, when you walk into the coffee shop and then you go to pay for that Starbucks coffee, and it's only worth a dollar, um, a do your actual dollar bill doesn't do that. It's a store of value or gold's a store of value. Uh, Bitcoin is definitely too volatile to be considered a reliable store of value well, today. You know, and, and they, you <clears throat> think that smart people won't get involved in something like this, but there is there's an investment out there that'll attract emotionally to you. And I'm thinking of the big short of you know that real estate that's the way to go and you know it wasn't that long ago 10 to 15 years and gosh we're almost almost kind of deja vu again in the real estate market any comments we're 22 years into this decade and we've, we're already looking at our third one with the dot-com bust, the 08 bust, and now we've got the Bitcoin and we've got real estate. So like Mike said, it may not repeat, but it certainly rhymes. Yeah, I think for real estate, I mean, and just like any investment, keep fees low, have a long-term outlook. I, For example, I, I bought, uh, we bought our first condo back in 2004, um, saw that go up uh, and increase in value to 2007-8 fall back below where we bought it. And then we just sold it uh, in February of this year. Um, but we were able to lock in low term, low financing for long term and everything worked out fine, even though we bought near the top. 
Do you um, do you that, look at uh, people's real estate, uh, their home as an investment? No, not their primary home should never really be looked at as an investment. Um, it's a you're, it's where you lay your, your head. <laughs> it should okay. not be looked at as investment. Uh, second properties, rental properties, yes, and we incorporate that into our financial plans. Um, but we actually don't use the primary as funding someone's uh, lifestyle needs. Um, uh, Paul, you want to add anything there? No, I mean, I think that, I think that bulk of it has been said. Um, yeah. yeah. You know, that what I see sometimes in, uh, uh, is the uh, home, if somebody's in their nineties or a hundred and they ran out of cash, at least there's a possibility of using the home uh, either to downsize or a possible reverse mortgage as a last resort to, you know, to uh, finance until you die. Cause you yeah. can't take your money with you. You just want to know the date of death and that way you can spend your last dollar. Uh, let's uh, Don, you have a question. So just as a note, incidentally, I was curious a while back about Bitcoin. So on May 20th of 2017, Bitcoin was valued at two thousand dollars. Yeah. Seven months later, it was nineteen thousand seven hundred dollars. Twelve months later, it was three thousand three hundred dollars. Goes on and on like this. In uh, let's see, April of twenty one, it was sixty thousand. In May of twenty one, it was thirty thousand. If you have all the money in the world to play with, put part of it in Bitcoin and have a good time. Don't yeah, invest in Vegas. It. Go to Vegas. Well, this, this is Vegas. <laughs> it's Vegas. It's really sorry. Volatile. Just just some notes. So. Yeah, no, that's it's, it's great. And I mean, the technology behind these cryptocurrencies, uh, blockchain, I won't get too much into the weeds, but it might be great and it could be very useful. And, and could cryptocurrencies be something that, that become more stable uh, in the future? Yes. Uh, could governments start to, to use them uh, instead of hard currencies for sure um but the the it's the wild west today and and i'd be very cautious uh looking at it as an investment it's purely speculative at this point do you use uh, uh <laughs> gold or um any kind of metal uh, as far as in your uh, clients portfolios we do a tiny bit um in gold um gold has is more of a store of value it doesn't produce income um, but from a portfolio management standpoint, gold does well on the extremes uh, in high inflationary environments or in a depression. Um, there's a run to gold. Uh, we're not in the extremes that often. Uh, think of a probability curve. I mean, 95% of the time, we're not in the extremes. Um, so while gold doesn't do well most of the time, it does well on the extremes. So we hold gold, but only for a very small portion as a hedge in the portfolio to protect on the downside. And, and that's what you, not at all times. That's only that's not at certain, all times. Certain certain yeah. periods. And when you say small, what does that mean? Two, three percent. Two, three percent. Okay. Yeah. How about commodities? Commodities are really volatile as well. Um, and so typically, no, we don't hold direct commodities. I mean, the S&P 500, we get exposure through companies we own, uh, you might own like a Exxon Mobil or Chevron or something like that, um, where you're going to have commodity exposure. So, so for most of us, we should stay away from commodities. Yeah. Uh, how? What does IG mean? Uh, that's intermediate. Uh, um, that's bonds. That's a bond? Intermediate yeah. government. Intermediate okay. government bonds. And yeah. what, is a, what does core CPI mean? That's inflation. Uh, the consumer price index is the the CPI is the term for it. So that's stripping out uh, food and energy. That's the core component because those are volatile components of inflation. And then CPI is the consumer price index. So what is your uh, thoughts about, we hear a lot of information about inflation this year. Uh, is it something that we should be panicked about or what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, over the long run, inflation is bad. It reduces your purchasing power. Um, and while we, you want to hedge against inflation, and to do that, you can't have your money under a mattress 
or in cash. Um, you just earn, don't earn enough. So you need growth in the portfolio. Um, today, bonds actually pay more now after selling off recently. So for example, 10-year treasury is paying close to 3%. Over the long run, we think inflation is going to be kind of in the 25 to 3% over the next decade. At least you're getting a return of money now owning bonds. That's a 10-year treasury. Other bonds pay three and a half to up to 5%. Um, so you don't see uh, the uh, making any dramatic moves based on this year's inflation rate? No, we do believe, I mean, it will come back down from these levels. We don't think we're going into a 1970s, early 80s type of inflation spiral. Um, a lot of the, the used car, new car sales are coming down. Supply chain issues will get resolved. The geopolitical crisis will get resolved eventually. Oil will come back down. But we don't think we're going back to the inflation rates pre-COVID of 2% where we were for the last 20 years. Um, so we do think inflation is going to run a little hotter um, over the next decade, but not where it is today. So so mm -hmm. one, of, one of the things that I hear from you all is, is, is that you all being a fee-only fiduciary advisors is that you prevent your clients from making any major mistakes. Yeah, that's our goal. I th think of it like bowling. We're just, we're the bumpers just trying to keep you out of the gutter. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. It's like, to, because the media will, you know, if you listen to it enough, they have to go on and focus on a little bit of the fear. And you guys kind of go back and say, no, your portfolio is good. There's no major changes that you need to make. Everything is fine. Yeah, we. Yeah. that's why and, we and run honestly, the financial plan. Yeah, everything that we do is similar to what you do here, Pete. And that's why we love being part of this program. It's all about education. The more that people understand, the more that people know, the more likely they are to make the right decisions and not make a panicked or emotional decision that could lead to really impacting their finances negatively. Yeah. And you can get highly emotional about money. <laughs> How can you not? It's literally your life savings. I yes. People all the time. Advisors are like, oh, you can't work on emotion. I'm sorry. This is my life savings. How do you yes. like fully remove emotions? You just can't. Can't. That's, that's, why, having a that's professional why Paul and I have with. no hair. We're <laughs> yeah. using our hair. Exactly. <laughs> let's go. Exactly. Let's go to the next slide. Get rid of your faces. <laughs> <laughs> So, okay, what is a REIT? Yeah, it's a real estate investment trust. Um, and what that really is, there's a, this is a busy slide, but it's really just a, kind of like a mutual fund. You pool your money together, you own a fractional interest in uh, real estate and either through a mutual fund, uh, can buy REITs, um, you can own a REIT publicly traded, you can own private real estate and typically pooled with someone. Uh, in something called a DST. Um, there are private real estate and like limited partnerships. Um, but the key is the fees that go along with this. Unfortunately, real estate is also another thing that is sold. Um, so you see something called maybe like a non-traded REIT. Um, stay away. Uh, <clears throat> stay away because typically the upfront commission is about 5%. There's acquisition costs of another 2% or so. There's ongoing property management fees of 3%. There's a disposal fee of 2%. Um, they say for every dollar invested in a non-traded REIT, uh, only 87 cents goes into the ground. Okay, guys, um, we only have about five, less than five minutes left. Perfect. So let's I go through some only, of the others. Yeah, I think we've only actually got one, one more slide left. left okay, yeah. good. So uh, yeah, just real estate. There's a lot of hidden fees as well. Um, and so that, that's it. That's it. Let, come on screen. Oh, this is, uh, let, no, this is your more. last one. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, last one is looking at just reverse mortgages. Simply put, a reverse mortgage is a um, way to turn your home into an asset that you can use to live off of. So maybe you have... Uh, you know, most commonly we, where we see this with individuals is someone that's lived longer than anticipated, um, spent down on all their investments, um, just has a bank account, maybe Social Security coming in. And so they need a, something else to help make ends meet. Most commonly, that's where a reverse mortgage is going to be used, 
where a mortgage is done on the house, but instead of you paying on it, um, instead it's giving you a paycheck from that. That's why it's called a reverse mortgage. Um, most commonly where we see these used is just to help um, coordinate assets. Um, so like I said, if you have, you know, living here in California, right? The median home, median home price now is a million dollars. Just hit that the other day. You know, definition of a millionaire in California is a homeowner. So um, wow. for a lot of us, a lot of us, is, it's the biggest asset that most people own. And so at some point, um, it's good to know about reverse mortgages and that they're out there. It's not something we want to lead with. And it's not something that we want to rely on. They can be very expensive and very confusing. In fact, if you go through the process to get a reverse mortgage, you have to talk with an independent third party and that individual is making sure that you understand what it is that you're signing up for, making sure that you're mentally competent for it because there's so much there in the past, there's so much fraud and um, misuse of reverse mortgages. So right. let's uh, do a wave if you're your slide. Let's go on a screen. Come on uh, up, uh, Don. So the message, what I'm hearing is in the investment world today is it's a sales world and be extremely cautious. Yep. Is that, you know? That's exactly it. Yeah. Know what you're getting into. Read the fine print. Um, try to. Most define... of the individuals in the industry uh, will try to dress themselves up as fee only fiduciaries, but uh, they're selling you product. Make sure you understand how your advisor is being paid. By the way, we use advisors only for people who are fee only. We use the term broker for someone who it gets paid on commission. Don, any last words? Yes, thank you very much. This is financial <laughs> and estate literacy. So it's week four talking about the investment world. And I thank you all very much. And we will see you next week for equity and fixed income investing. Thank you, Pete. Thank you, gentlemen. Michael, it's been a Paul, good time. thank you so much. Thank really you appreciate it. Appreciate it.